Hello to everybody. I'm Sébastien Dossé. I'm the musical director of Ensemble Correspondance. And uh, I'm happy to be with you for, for this, this little talk um, today. Uh, thank you for inviting me to Idadjo. Um, usually we are circulating between Caen in Normandy, where the ensemble is based now, uh, Paris, festivals, concert halls. Uh, but today I'm at home, as you can imagine, I'm in Burgundy, uh, in my little house. Um, so for two months I have time for working, for reading, for editing music, for preparing new projects, um, but also for gardening and always alternating um, between anxiety and hope for the future. So. Um, as you maybe know, Correspondance, the group is uh, mostly dedicated to 17th century repertoire uh, from, uh, from history things to um, new sound in the 20, 20th, uh, 21st century. And with the idea of um, taking these ancient things uh, history, knowing the past, uh, to help us to, to, to create something new today. Um, today, I would like to, to talk with you about the, the Louvre. Um, as I think everybody knows, uh, the place, uh, I will show it to you here. Um, the place is very famous today because it's the biggest museum in the world. Um, with many paintings, with many sculptures, uh, beautiful collections, and um, one of the most visited places uh, in the world, too. Uh, the beautiful auditorium where the ensemble is now in res residency. But you have to know that in the 70th century, uh, this was the chief residence and the main uh, palace of the French court, uh, and this French court was always moving from one castle to another one. Uh, Fontainebleau, Saint-Germain, Vincennes, Chambord uh, were the other places. Uh, this moving court uh, was depending on the season, on the king's will, uh, but also on the um, hunting season. When the court stay in the Louvre. I have another picture, I think. Ah, yes, yeah, the first one is the Tuileries place. So uh, seeing the, the garden um, of Paris in the, in the west. And this is the other entry of the, of the palace, which is going in the Cour Carré. And uh, this picture is uh, painted from, from the church saint germain l'Auxerrois. So, um, when the, the court stay in the Louvre, uh, all the royal family could live there, uh, even if some of them uh, could also live in Paris where they had their own palace. Uh, for instance, Gaston d'Orléans, who was the brother of Louis XIII, had his own palace, uh, which is called Palais du Luxembourg, which is now the Senate. Uh, so the royal family lived in the Louvre, uh, but the other uh, courtyards lived in town in Paris with their families, uh, but they came every day uh, in the Louvre, uh, in the palace to, to, to work. Um, actually, even if there were many royal places uh, in France, the Louvre was the real heart of the political life of the time. Um, the official musicians uh, of the king uh, were following him uh, depending all these places. So they were attached to the king himself and not to uh, a particular place. Um, for some decades, they were organized in very uh, strict manner. Um, some of them were devoted to the king's apartments. Uh, they are called la, la musique de la chambre du roi. Some others uh, were de 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 devoted to the chapel and to the sacred music. They were called La Chapelle Musique. And some others were, were mainly playing wind instruments and percussions, and they were devoted to outside music. They were called La Grande Écurie. 
So the king's music consisted in three groups, uh, and between these three groups, there was a very uh, strict hierarchy, and um, the, the music of the Chambre du Roi was the, the first and um, the most important group. So for today, I would like to, to, to talk maybe more precisely about this music of the, of the Chambre uh, in the apartments of the Louvre. Uh, the most important repertoire uh, was what we call air de cour. And uh, if we generally, generally think that new things in music comes from the court or the prince's houses uh, with their beautiful teams of musicians, in this case, uh, the air de cour really came from the city, from Paris, from places called the salon. Uh, I've a picture to show to you. Up. Um, voilà. um, what is a salon? Uh, it is a room in a noble house called Hotel Particulier. Like this one you can see uh, on, the, on the picture. Uh, this one is the, 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 the front building of uh, Hotel de Sully, which has been built at the beginning of 17th century. And it's very representative of what can be an Hotel Particulier. This is like a little palace, uh, but in the town. Um, Many of these hotels particuliers were uh, built or rebuilt uh, in Paris during all the 17th century. And the main headquarter for this hotel particulier was the Marais district uh, around the, 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 the beautiful Place Royale, which is now called Place des Vosges. Voilà. Um, the room called Salon is generally the reception room uh, as you can see now, um, in the house, and uh, it's also called la chambre d'appara. Uh, chambre, so you, as you can see, there is a bed, but this bed is not used to sleep. It is used to show uh, how rich was the guest, uh, because it's uh, a gorgeous furniture. Um, and in, this, uh, in all this room, which is quite large, you can see beautiful furniture, but also paintings, you can see tapestries, you can see uh, uh, all this uh, furniture, uh, probably quite expensive. So uh, all these people you can see are looks quite uh, wealthy with beautiful dresses. So you can see this is um, not so intimate. It's quite formal um, with, with all these um, demonstrative things. Um, the salon also means the regular meeting for a group. Uh, and this group, as you can see, is uh, performing music, mostly lute and singing. They are uh, reading, they are improvising poetry, and um, they are talking about many subjects uh, like science, philosophy, and all that uh, this talking with this playing music, uh, this improvising um, uh, is composing uh, a sort of a beautiful art of conversation. And this conversation is made in a very sophisticated way. Um, who are the organizers of the salon? They, are, they were mostly women. Uh, or noble women as Madame de Rambouillet, which is one of the most uh, famous ones, uh, whose salon was called La Chambre Bleue. Uh, but also they can be courtesans as Ninon de L'Enclos. Um, the most interesting thinkers, uh, the most interesting musicians, uh, poets, novelists, because the beginning of the, of the genre at this time, uh, all these people met here to talk in a very polite way. Uh, we think that the French art of conversation really started at this point with this kind of assemblies. The sophistication um, was really the DNA of this salon. Uh, some of the women uh, were so sophisticated that they were called les précieuses, uh, the 
precious women. Um, and Molière, the famous play writer, added the precious ridicule. Uh, and he even wrote two, two comedies about them. He definitely found that these manners uh, were quite stupid and ridiculous. They, they were probably going too far away. Um, truly, I think it was probably sometimes a little bit superficial and quite funny. For instance, um, I will show you a picture of a famous Précieuse, uh, Julie D'Angène. As you can see, the, this woman uh, on this painting is very, uh, very smart, very well dressed, uh, with these flowers, with these manners uh, in holding the, the baton. So she's quite uh, characteristic of the of what could be a, a precious uh, at, at this time. And um, ah, do you see this picture? Sorry, I was talking. You didn't see it. Uh, so she's Julie D'Angène, and she was the, the daughter of Madame de Rambouillet, one of the precious I, I told you about. Um, and uh, there is a story about her because um, she, give, she became a, a, a great patroness of the precious and uh, with all these beautiful manners. And one of um, the ideas she had is that eating was too vulgar. So she invented for her and all her guests uh, a way of eating without masticating. So with eating creams and so on. So probably, um, probably this was the, the, all this manner, this sophistication was going maybe too far away. And was, it was quite funny uh, for uh, outside people. But actually, it was also probably very inspiring for the poets because um, all this ceremonial uh, asked them for invention, for new words, for um, uh, new ways of expressing themselves. And they, they created a new world, uh, like a dream in which um, they were totally living with new names, uh, like in the novels of this time, uh, but also like um, irrealistic shepherds of a golden age. Uh, and they were always keeping this sophistication, um, which was called la galanterie. About the music in the salon, um, the music was taught to every aristocrat of this time. So uh, the singing, um, the lute playing were not only for professionals, but mainly for the guests themselves. Um, we were, of course, mostly noble people, aristocrats, uh, or great thinkers, or great artists. Uh, it has been a moment uh, where poetry was very creative, uh, deeply influenced by uh, pastoral, and also interested in new forms and interested in, in what was going on abroad, especially in Italy. Music was following these new ideas, uh, especially that one that music must follow poetry and text to make them more intense. The airs uh, were mostly sung by one of the guests, singing his own lyrics, uh, playing the lute himself. Uh, so we could, we could say that this music was made uh, by and for the amateur, the music lovers, and not for professionals. Maybe we can add that, 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 that the music was also a social art. Uh, when, um, when he was singing the love of a shepherd, the singer really uh, sang the, his love for a woman attending to the assembly. Um, the success of this, all this repertoire uh, of airs went through the, the walls of the noble houses. Um, we can find them in the streets uh, with new lyrics. Uh, but also in a sacred way, uh, not at church, of course, but uh, for domestic prayer or, or in the convents, because in the convents, uh, you had only uh, noble uh, young ladies. So they learned um, music, they learned youth, and they were uh, involved in this kind of music. So when they, they went in, into the convents, they kept this, um, this um, uh, 
manner of playing music. Um, I would like to make you hear one of the most famous airs of this time due to Pierre Guédron, uh, who is one of the maybe mo most famous composer of this time, but also one of the most interesting um, of the court of Louis XIII. Um, this air is called Quel espoir de guérir. I will try to, to show you the score in the same time. Uh, just let me one second. Yes. Quel espoir de This was um, an air by Pierre Guédron, Quel espoir de guérir, and uh, just for one voice and the lute playing on a contemporary poetry. Uh, as I told you before, it has been probably one of the most famous um, air in all the 17th century. Um, right now, um, I would like to make you hear something uh, uh, some other thing. Uh, this is the same air, but in its original version. So, uh, in a polyphonic way and for four voices. Oh, this is the score. A modern one, sorry. was the same Quel espoir de guérir by Pierre Guédron, but in its uh, polyphonic version. Um, so if the first one was probably closer than uh, uh, closer to the, the uh, universe of the Salon, uh, with one lute and one singer, uh, the second one was probably closer to the musical uh, uh, atmosphere of the court. A polyphonic version with more singers, uh, but also with the vials, flutes, uh, and lutes. Um, I, I think I don't have time to explain that, but uh, maybe you have heard. If you sh if you see if you read the the music, uh, uh, if you read the score uh, when you listen to the music, there are many differences, and this is the 
the manner of singing of this time with many ornamentation um, that are improvised. And this is all the, um, the, the, the salt of the music of this time. When you have uh, five or six strophes of music, uh, you, you have to, to change each time with new ornaments and um, all these ornaments are improvised. Maybe you have also remarked that the text was different in the second version because this one is using a new sacred text. Uh, this is a contrafacta. So if the music appeared in the Salon in Paris, why do we say air de cour? Um, of course, uh, many aristocrats brought it to the court and little by little, the, the, these airs have been played in the king's apartments. Um, the team of the king's musicians make us think that probably the polyphonic version you have heard is closer uh, to the musical atmosphere of the court. But I think the principal reason of the name Air de Cour um, is probably because the music has been composed by um, a musician working for the king. Uh, so Pierre Guédron is one of them, but also Antoine Boesset or François de Chancy. Uh, are among the, the, the most famous. Maybe I have to say that the king himself, Louis XIII, was uh, a musician and even, even a composer. Um, he, had, uh, he has composed uh, some airs, but also uh, a whole ballet, de, um, which is called Ballet de la Merlaison, and the music is very good. And we have even recorded um, a little dance uh, of this Ballet de la Merlaison in our last recording, Les Plaisirs du Louvre. Um, at the court, uh, the king had a, a special team for this kind of chamber music, uh, of course, more developed than, than, than the simple lute uh, and, the, and the voice we had in the, in the salon. Um, he had generally 10 singers, professional singers. Um, they were officially only men, but we know uh, know that there, there were at least one or two female singers. Um, he had also two or three uh, children uh, to sing the soprano line and some soft in instruments as uh, gambas, flutes, um, spinets, uh, or lutes, of course. The music was performed at many moments of the of the day, depending on the uh, on the ceremonial, uh, but also on the willing of the king himself. Uh, it was mostly played in the king's apartments, and especially in the beautiful chambre de parade, uh, which is uh, like a, a salon, but maybe more uh, uh, noble, of course, more uh, uh, with more paintings. And it's, it was probably one of the be most beautiful place in the, in the Louvre. Um, and these airs uh, were sometimes also included in the great shows uh, of the palace called Ballet de Cour. And uh, I will talk uh, uh, about this Ballet de Cour in the, in the third uh, rendezvous with you in uh, two weeks. Uh, sometimes uh, the airs are not strophic poems, but little dramatic scenes as dialogues, um, like, like uh, we could say, like a foreseeing of the, um, of the future opera, we, which, which will be created by Lully in 1673. Um, I would like to make you hear one of this beautiful hair, uh, air uh, composed for um, four voices. Uh, it is uh, due to Antoine Boisset, who, is, who was um, uh, maybe the, the, the greatest composer of Louis XIII, and um, published uh, eight books of air. So he was very famous for this genre of music and uh, very rec recognized for that. Um, this air is called Je perds le repos, uh, and it is written for four voices. Uh, ah, I don't have the score, sorry. Up. Sorry, just the music. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Je perds le repos um, by Antoine Boessé. And as you can hear, it's uh, like a, a conversation between four singers and very free, very soft with ornamentations. And this is quite characteristic of, the, um, of this beautiful art of Air de Cour, um, maybe in, right in the middle of the 17th century. Uh, all these airs uh, are made. Um, uh, on poems uh, which are about love, uh, generally with a, a cruel shepherdess uh, scorning the true love of a, of a shepherd. Um, the pastoral atmosphere, atmosphere uh, also gives a, a large space for nature. We have generally many images, many symbols, but the poem must not be too explicit. Um, you can always uh, understand uh, an undertext which make uh, all the taste to this poetry. I think I've been too long, um, but I maybe for next week I would like to, to, to talk with you about uh, the sacred music in the Louvre um, before explaining uh, the week after all the extraordinary musical life uh, of, the, of the palace. I would like to just to, to tell you that we are preparing now um, a great project with the Louvre, the, with the museum, um, with the Festival of Ambronay and the University of Sorbonne. Uh, it's a new project for Autumn 21. It is a MOOC about uh, the French musical life in 17th century with seven episodes um, built from different types of place, cathedral, convents, um, uh, theaters, etc. And uh, this is more than three hours of uh, explanation, a lot of sound, a lot of music, uh, images, and the idea that um, everyone who is interested in history, in architecture, in socio sociology, and of course in music, um, can be interested in this project. 
uh, you will have to, to subscribe um, to attend to it. Uh, so please check um, our website. Uh, I think it will be available from September. Um, should you have uh, some further questions, please feel free to write to me to the email address um, uh, of Idadjo. Uh, I hope I, I, I will be able to, to answer it uh, quickly by email. Uh, or if you, if you like, uh, send me questions for next week or the week after on Sacred Music or on the Ballet de Cour. Uh, I would be very happy to, to answer to it. And I propose you to finish with a last air uh, just uh, before to say goodbye, this is Le Concert des Oiseaux, and the uh, music uh, is by Etienne Moulinier, uh, who was also a great composer this time, but um, mostly attached to the, the court of the brother of Louis XIII, Gaston d'Orléans, and uh, is one of the great, beautiful composer of this time. And we finish with, with this air. Um, he composed for a ballet, uh, but next week we will talk a lot about his uh, sacred music because I think it's one of the most interesting one in the 17th century. So um, see you next, next week and uh, enjoy this Concert des Oiseaux.